The United Church of Canada joins with others to renew the call to the Canadian government to intervene with Israel and de-escalate the spiraling violence in East Jerusalem and Gaza and negotiate its end. Uh, moderator Rich Bott says, I invite United Church people to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and to put faith into action by writing towards Minister Garneau to uphold international law. Uh, so the question about next weekend, next weekend is the annual general meeting for Region 15. And this year, once again, it will be a Zoom meeting. It starts on Friday at 6 p.m. and will continue until Saturday at 4. Thanks to the Faith Formation and Leadership Development Committee of Region 15, uh, congregations have been provided with a service that will be used for, that can be used for next Sunday morning. And uh, in in union, I guess, with our brothers and sisters in other United Churches, we will be using um, that service uh, next Sunday morning on May 30th. Again, it will be a Zoom service. The link will come out as usual. Um, you just won't hear Reverend Sharon's voice. Uh, each year during July and August, we change the time of our worship services. And this year we are going to be doing that starting in June. So next week will be the last Sunday for a while that we will be meeting at 11. Uh, following that, we'll be beginning our services at 10 uh, on Sunday mornings. Uh, our mission and service goal for 2021 is $10,700. <laughs> this means we need to raise uh, an average of $891 per week. Despite the current situation, givings for the past four months have remained steady, and we're only $266 below uh, our commitment for the first four months. So congratulations and thanks go out to everyone who is supporting Mission and Service. We do remind people to please continue to donate to Mission and Service during the summer months so that we can continue to strive to reach our goal for the year. Uh, until the current lockdown is over, we are going to be reinstating our Monday morning coffee uh, by Zoom. And that will go from 10 to 11 starting tomorrow. And you can watch for a Zoom link being sent out from Beacon for, for that purpose. And feel free to join, uh, bring your coffee and your conversation. And those are all of the announcements that I have for this Sunday. And if there are no others, I invite you to greet each other with a wave and the peace of Christ. Morning. 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 Okay, as we begin our service, I'm going to mute you all. I finally figured out how to do that. <laughs> So as we gather here, each in our own homes, we take a moment to give thanks for the land on which we gather and to recognize those who inhabited this land long before our ancestors arrived, caring for the land and holding it in sacred trust. And so we offer our gratitude for this land, which by law is the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq people. And as we light our Christ candle this morning, we open our hearts and our lives to the light of Christ as we commit ourselves to allow that light to shine through us in all that we do. And now let us join in. Let us join in our call to worship. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit poured down upon the gathered disciples. As we gather here today, God's Spirit is with us. The winds of the Spirit swept through the upper room blowing away the past and bringing fresh new possibilities. 
The winds of the spirit blow through us, challenging us to embrace the future. The fire of the spirit rushed through that upper room, igniting the imaginations of those first disciples and kindling in them a passion for God. The fire of the spirit ignites in us a deep passion to follow the way of Christ. And so we gather today in anticipation, ready for whatever surprises and whatever challenges God's spirit may bring. We gather to worship God. Let us pray together our opening prayer. Come Holy Spirit, the one who sang a new melody as God's creation rose from chaos, who wept at the dark shadow of a cross and who danced early in the morning at the opening of an empty tomb. Come Holy Spirit, the one who could not be contained by wind or flame or breath, the one who blesses the church with courage, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit, come to us as we gather here today. Teach us to sing a new song and dance with reckless abandon. Teach us to be courage finders, peacemakers, and love bearers. Here in this gathering of believers, as you did with those so long ago, Breathe on us now, blowing away our fear and our hesitation and transforming our lives and reshaping us as your people. Amen. Thank you. 
in the book of Acts, of the Acts of the Apostles, we read the story of the first Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection, when the gathered disciples experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. Kellyanne, you may be muted. You may need to unmute yourself. That's okay, I'm muted. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, thank you. Acts chapter two, one through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, all believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious people who had come from every country in the world. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. They were all excited because all of them learned all of them heard the believers talking in their own languages. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, these people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it that they all hear us, that all of us hear them speaking in our own native languages? We are from Parthia, Media, and Elam, and Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia from Pontus and Asia, from Phrygia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and the regions of Libya and Cyrene. Some of us are from Rome, both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism. And some of us are from Crete and Arabia. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things that God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers, saying, these people are drunk. Then P Peter stood up with the other 11 apostles, and a loud voice began to speak to the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me and let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This is what I will do in the last days, God says. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will pro proclaim my message. Your young men will see visions and your old men will have dreams. Yes, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will proclaim my message. I will perform miracles in the sky above and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood, fire, and thick smoke. The sun will be darkened and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And then whoever calls on out to the Lord for help will be saved. Psalm 104 reminds us that wisdom was part of the creative power creating at God's side in the very beginning. Lord, you have made so many things. How wisely you made them all. The earth is filled with your creatures. There is the ocean large and wide where countless creatures live, large and small alike. The ships sail on it and, it play in, and in it plays Leviathan, the sea monster which you made. All of them depend on you to give them food when they need it. You give it to them and they eat it. You provide food and they are satisfied. When you turn away, they are afraid. When you take away your breath, they die and go back to dust from which they came. But when you give them breath, they are created. You give new life to the earth. May the glory of the Lord last forever. May the Lord be happy with all he has made. He looks at earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they pour out like smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. 
all as long as I live, I will sing praises to my God. May he be pleased with my song, for my gladness comes from him. In the letter to the church in Rome, we are told creation still waits for the completion of God's plan and that we as humans still wait to fully understand how we are accepted as God's children. It also tells us that the spirit that who, it is the spirit that pleads with God for us in groans with, that words cannot express or in the words of the new revised standard version of a Bible, which I absolutely love with sighs too deep for words. From Romans 8, 22 to 27. For we know that up to the present time, all creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. But it's not just creation alone which groans, we who have the spirit as the first of God's gifts also groan within ourselves as we wait for God to make us his children and set our whole being free. For it was by hope that we were saved. But if we see what we hope for, then it is, it, excuse me, then it is not really hope. For who of us hopes for something we see? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans and word that words cannot express. And God, who sees into our hearts, knows that the thought of this, what the thought of the Spirit is, because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. Before his death, John tells us that Jesus tried to prepare his disciples. He tried to explain that he would not be with them forever but that when he was gone, he would send another, a helper or an advocate who would be with them always. This helper would be the spirit who reveals the truth about God. From John chapter 15, 26 to 27 and then followed by John 16, four through 15. The helper will come, the spirit who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the father. I will send him to you from the father and he will speak about me and you too will speak about me because you have been with me from the very beginning. I did not tell you these things in the begin at the beginning for I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me where I'm going. And now that I have told you, our hearts are full of sadness. But I'm telling you the truth. It is better for you that I go away. Because if I do not go, the helper will not come. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. They are wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. They are wrong about what is right because I'm going to the Father and you will not see me anymore. And they are wrong about judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. I have more to tell you but now it would be too much for you to bear. When, however, the spirit comes who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you all into, into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of the things to come. He will give me glory 
because he will take what I say and tell it to you. All that my father has is mine. That is why I said that the spirit will take what I give him and tell it to you. You know, I'm actually glad I wasn't there. I'm glad I wasn't there with the others in that upper room on Pentecost. Ever since Jesus' death, we have been meeting in secret. Wherever we could find a place that was safe from the authorities. That morning, we had all agreed to meet. But I wasn't able to get away. My family was scared. At first, when I came home and told them that I had met Jesus and that I was sure he was the Messiah, they were as excited as I was. But when things started going bad, when the authorities started warning people against him and started plotting to destroy him, they were frightened. They were frightened for themselves and for me. They warned me not to get involved. I had to sneak out whenever I could. That day, that Pentecost, the family were keeping an extra close eye on me. I couldn't get away. But after what happened that day, part of me is glad I wasn't there. Now I have to admit that's not how I felt at the time. I was part of the crowd that was headed towards the temple to celebrate Pentecost. That had been the plan all along. We were to join the crowd and then sneak away when no one was looking, meet in that upper room. But as I said, my family was keeping watch and I never got the chance. So I simply remained there with them as part of the crowd. And that's when I saw Peter. He and some of the other disciples appeared out of nowhere and began talking to anyone who would listen, telling them about Jesus. I was sure that with all the news we were hearing about how the Romans were trying to wipe out all the followers of Jesus, that they would be arrested and maybe even killed. But then something strange happened. People stopped to listen. But these people were from all over. They'd come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Pentecost festival. And they were from all different parts of the world and they spoke different languages. And yet all of them seemed to understand what the disciples were saying. At first people were just amazed, but then they realized who it was that the disciples were talking about. And some of them became very frightened. Someone shouted out, oh, ignore them, they're drunk. A nervous laugh went through the crowd and as if they were relieved to have a way out. If they were questioned by the authorities, they could say they were just staying to listen with amusement, that they'd never believed what the disciples were saying. But then Peter stood up. Peter, who'd always just said whatever came into his mind and often ended up regretting it. Peter stood up and spoke with a calm and an eloquence that I've never seen in him before. He spoke in a way that reminded me of the first time I'd heard Jesus speak. And this time, people really did listen. They couldn't help it. There was something in the way that he spoke that, that had a power to it. You couldn't help but listen. I could never do that. I could never stand up in front of a whole crowd of people and tell them about Jesus. I have enough trouble just trying to convince my own family. If I knew that someone was interested and they asked me about him, 
I could probably talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, but even that is hard. How can I be sure that they were really interested in Jesus and that they weren't just trying to trick me so that they could report me to the authorities? That's the way most of us felt. At least I thought it was. We talked about how hard it was to let people know about Jesus without ending up being arrested. Everybody was scared. And yet here they were openly preaching about Jesus. I learned later what had happened in that upper room. And what happened there made all the difference. That's what made it possible for Peter to speak with such eloquence and for James and Philip and Andrew and Matthew and Thaddeus to have the courage to speak up and be understood by everyone. I learned later that in that upper room, they had been touched by the spirit. But I wasn't there. Andrew told me about it. He told me that they had heard a sound like a great wind. The kind of wind that stirs up a storm in the desert. He said it was frightening, and yet it wasn't. He said it, it felt more like a feeling of breathlessness anticipation you know when you you know something's about to happen but you don't know what you just know that it's something amazing and then he told me that he felt like he was being touched by fire a flame that somehow ignited something within him they all felt it. And it left them with a burning desire to go out and tell everyone what had happened, to tell everyone about Jesus. Oh, how I wanted to feel that. How I wanted to be touched by that fire. How I wanted to feel that passion that they felt. I knew what it meant. Jesus had promised that we would all be touched by the spirit and that that spirit would give us the power to teach, to heal, and to carry on with the mission that Jesus himself had started. That was what happened in that upper room. That's what happened to the ones who gathered there. They were touched by the Holy Spirit. But then I saw what happened next. Within days, Peter and John were arrested. It's true that they were released the next day, but I knew even then that the authorities weren't finished with them. When they were released, Peter and John were warned not to speak about Jesus anymore, or they would be punished. I think if they could have gotten away with it, the authorities would have thrown them right back in prison and never let them out. But people were so worked up by hearing Peter's speech and by seeing him heal that crippled beggar that Ananias, Caiaphas, and all the rest of them were terrified of what the crowd would do. So they let them go. For now, anyway. But Peter and John and the others didn't keep quiet. They kept preaching. They kept telling people all the things that Jesus had done and all the things that he had taught them. They talked about how he said that everyone was loved. Everyone mattered. They talked about how God's love was freely given to us. 
kind of like a, a kind and gentle parent. And how God longs for our love in return. They also talked about how loving God wasn't enough. We had to love each other as well. Regardless of what nationality we are, what class we come from, what we've done in the past, even regardless of whether or not we were Jews. They kept preaching. No matter how many times they were warned, they never stopped. It got more and more dangerous. But they still went on telling everyone about Jesus. Even when they knew without any doubt that if they weren't silent, it would cost them their lives. And eventually it did. Almost all of them were put to death. So now maybe you understand why I say I'm glad I wasn't there. If I'd been there, if I had been touched by the Holy Spirit, I would have had no choice but to talk about it. I would have had to go around telling people about Jesus and about all that he had done and said and about all that he meant to so many of us. I would have had to share the incredible feeling of joy that comes from knowing that God loves me. And I would have had to do everything in my power to pass that love on and to help people come to understand who Jesus was and who he continues to be for me and for many others today. So why am I telling you this? Well, I guess it's because no matter what may have happened to the others, and no matter how great the risk might be, I just can't let the story die. All the things that Jesus taught us, all the things that we learned from him, and yes, the way he changed our lives. These things have to be told. It's like, I don't know, it's like a fire burning inside me that I just can't deny. Because of Jesus, I know that God loves me and nothing can ever change that, not even death. I'm not as afraid as I once was. The love I learned about through Jesus is stronger than any fear I might feel. I know deep inside that no matter what I do, that love will always be there. And I can't keep it to myself. God's love doesn't work that way. Jesus once told us that it wasn't enough to say we love God. We had to love others as well. And we had to put our love into action. I can't think of any better way to do that right now than to share my story with you, to pass on the message that I received from Jesus. God loves us and wants us to love each other, no matter what the cost. It's strange. I, I never thought that I could stand up in front of people and talk about my faith. I certainly never imagined that I could explain it in a way that others could understand, in a way that made sense to anybody but me. And yet here I am. I wasn't in that upper room. But somehow, I feel like the ability that I've been given to speak to you today is a gift that's been given to me. It's like the gift that was given to those disciples that were gathered in the upper room. 
you don't suppose it's possible that the Holy Spirit could actually touch someone who wasn't there in that room on that Pentecost? Do you think that maybe the Spirit could reach out beyond the walls of that one room? Is it possible? Is that why I'm able to speak to you today? Is it possible that someone like me could actually be touched by the Spirit? And if it's possible for me, do you suppose maybe it's also possible for you? Thank <laughs> you. 
that's from the Congregational Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. At this time, our worship, we are reminded of our commitment to God. And that commitment also includes the gifts we offer. Normally, we would ask God's blessing upon the gifts we place on our offering plate, as well as the gifts we offer through par. But today, there are no offering plates. So instead, we remind people that as well as par and online donations, people can also drop off donations at the church by using the mail slot to the left of the office entry. As always, however, we need to remember that our financial contributions are only one of the many things that we have to offer. We offer our time, our talents, our abilities, our commitment, and our prayers. And so, whatever it is we offer today, let us ask God's blessing upon it. Let us pray. Loving God, as your spirit touched and blessed those disciples long ago, touch and bless the gifts that we offer you today, that they may be your grace and your power, and that through your spirit, they may be a blessing to others. Amen. And although we do not have a physical prayer jar, in which we place our prayers. We take a moment now of silence to offer our personal prayers for those who are named in our own hearts and thoughts, as well as those who are in the hearts and minds of all those gathered here. Amen. Our minute for mission today is entitled Celebrate Deaf Culture on Pentecost. On Pentecost, diverse languages proclaim the presence of God's spirit. So it's the perfect day to celebrate the glorious variety of languages and cultures God blesses in the world through, in the world through, including deaf culture. Few churches welcome and include people who are deaf. That's why your gifts through missions and service support the quinte, or is it cante, or the quint, quint? Quinty. Deaf, quinty? Deaf Fellowship in Belleville, Ontario. Since its inception in 2007, the fellowship has provided a point of culture and spiritual connection for people who are deaf and a place to celebrate deaf culture. When Peter Scarp visits a friend or attends a club, every conversation begins and ends with a hug. That's not unusual in his circles. It's just something we all do, explains the Canadian Hearing Service staff member. He continues to share insights about deaf culture, identity, norms, and rules of behavior. Deaf people value their eyes because they're the window of the world and their hands because they are extremely important tools, he says. History has not always recognized deaf culture or considered sign language important. Did you know that in 1880, 164 deaf educators from eight countries gathered to make a landmark education decision that would ban sign language from classrooms around the world? Then it was decided that oral lip reading education 
was better than manual sign education. Whenever you deprive a community of its language, you automatically deprive it of its culture, says Bill Wilson, a United Church minister whose father wasn't allowed to use sign language in residential school. Wilson, whose parents were deaf, considers American Sign Language his mother tongue. I consider my, myself bicultural, he says. The COVID-19 pandemic has been especially hard on deaf communities. Isolation rules make it challenging to access healthcare, support programs, and basic information. Online learning is also an issue. While some provinces provide online learning opportunities, unless a qualified teacher who is proficient in sign language is available, there are often not, they are often not accessible to deaf children and youth, says the Canadian Association of the Deaf in a statement. Language matters, especially now. Your generous support through missions and service means Quinte Deaf Fellowship continues to be a place for, of belonging, connection, advocacy, and care when it is needed most. So thank you. Our first people today is titled A Litany of Solidarity with the Thought with and Through the Spirit. It actually comes from an AIDS candlelight memorial service offered by the Christian AIDS Bureau of South Africa, but it speaks of the power and blessing of the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate at Pentecost. So let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill us. Come Holy Breath, live in us. Come Holy Wind, move through us. When we are led by impulses other than your spirit, we become slaves to our own desires and our own way of being is guided by fear. When we are guided by prejudice, fill us with love. When we are guided by pessimism, fill us with joy. When we are guided by misunderstanding, fill us with peace. When we are guided by superficial quick fixes, fill us with patience. When we are guided by self-interest, fill us with kindness. When we are guided by apathy, fill us with goodness. When we are guided by convenience, fill us with faithfulness. When we are guided by complacency, fill us with meekness. When we are guided by temptation, fill us with self-control. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us. Come, Holy Breath, live in us. Come, Holy Wind, move through us. Amen.
our benediction today is a Pentecost benediction written by Richard Bott and Shannon Tennant. In our moments of chaos, God is with us. In our moments of calm, God is with us. In our moments of life, God is with us. Hallelujah. Wherever we go, we are a Pentecost people, touched by fire, stirred by wind, called by God to help mend the world by sharing God's love with all. Alleluia. Amen. So I invite you now to unmute yourselves and have a little chat.